Hi there! So, this is the third episode of a Nominal Future show, and I'm your host, Alena Tkachenko. And tonight we're talking with Elizabeth, who is a co founder of Maker Girl. So, for the last, uh, for the past seven years, they're into uh, inspiring girls to study tech uh, via 3D printing workshops. So, we'll cover questions like how asking the right questions can lead you to the very inspiring and unusual findings. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, how kids' identity and uh, gender conception is formed and at which age it is formed and how it influences future career choices. And also we'll definitely cover the topic of COVID and how COVID influenced uh, the whole concept of Maker Girl. So, looking forward. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, I would really love to also have Julia in the discussion, but as we just talked, uh, she won't be here. But getting back to fall 2014, can you just tell us a bit about how the whole idea of the Maker Girl happened? and how you started to work together and what's what's the road has been yeah uh that's a very big question and um it's definitely been a labor of love and excitement uh with maker girl so um maker girl started in a social entrepreneurship class back in 2014 it was um, a class i took for fun as a senior in college in no way expected to start anything, but uh, we were challenged to think about three questions. Um, who are you? What bothers you? And how are you going to counteract what bothers you? And I had uh, thought of all of my uh, female peers, and I felt like I was on a campus that offered limitless opportunity to make and dream and build, and I didn't always feel that same drive um, from females. And started questioning why this was and um, thought about the maker mindset and why women don't have a maker mindset. And then, of course, that rabbit hole led me down the lack of girls in STEM. Um, I found that girls don't pursue STEM mainly for two reasons. Um, the first is that they don't think it's creative and they don't think that they can um, make an impact with STEM. So I wanted to show girls at a young age um, that these are obviously not true. We see um, women and men all over accomplishing um, big things and um, tackling big social issues with STEM. So a um, lot of my experiences as a young girl and making and crafting and wanted to combine that with a STEM-based experience. And I thought of 3D printing uh, because it takes uh, participants all the way from designing to having something in the palm of their hand that they can show off to all of their friends and family afterwards. And the reason that we focus on the seven to 10 year old age range is because a lot of middle school girls um, start thinking that they're not good at math or science, and then they completely shut out that path. So it's important to get girls excited about STEM at a young age. Um, and then for my co-founder, Julia, she was really interested in the idea um, mainly because she was interested in bringing more females into the C-suite and leadership. Um, so we met in that social entrepreneurship class. We had never um, actually exchanged many words before working on Maker Girl. She walked up to me and saw the idea and said, I have to work on this with you. Um, so that led to our first 3D printing session where neither of us had even 3D printed before, but thankfully we had a lot of help. Um, but we realized we were onto something when we saw the girls' eyes light up after they had received their 3D print. Um, then the next fall or the next spring, we did a few more sessions at the University of Illinois. Um, then the next year, we had this crazy big idea to take our sessions on the road. So um, we funded a $30,000 Kickstarter to take our sessions 
from coast to coast across the United States. Um, at the time, I was actually working full time at LinkedIn in San Francisco, and um, the Maker Girl Goes Mobile truck came to me there. And um, then we did another Kickstarter, and a few years later, we wanted to expand. And all the while, Julia and I were both working full time jobs. So we hired a full time executive director um, to do that and manage the fundraising and expansion. Um, and here we are today. We've educated 4,000 girls. In 24 states, our uh, full-time executive director, Mary Hadley, has done an amazing job transitioning our curriculum to um, doing virtual sessions. And we have a team of about 30 change makers who are mostly college STEM women um, running the sessions. And then we provided an experience for them in which we train them in how to be leaders in their respective fields, how to manage and uh, raise money so that they feel uh, very well prepared for leadership when they go on to their jobs after college. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds really great. But uh, just like coming to the topic, uh, let me let me ask some more questions for the very beginning for when you started, because uh, when I've learned that it's a 3D printing, uh, I just immediately mm -hmm. Start, uh, start to think that 3D printing is kind of like quite an expensive technology and it should have been even more expensive back in 2014. And um, based on what you just said and based on the idea that you didn't have any uh, experience with 3D printing before, I'm just wondering like how you have been choosing this compared to like all this uh, Raspberry Pi and Lego and everything? That's an interesting question and one I actually haven't received much before, but I'm glad you asked. I was in the College of Business and we were the first business school at the time, I believe, to have a maker lab. So it just so happened that I had experienced 3D printing um, at my school and it was in a room that was um, very easy for people to come in, in and out, oftentimes in engineering labs and engineering schools. Those machines are big and um, kind of user unfriendly to look at. So this was in a very compartmentalized space, like a classroom where you could come in and out with the um, 3D printers that were about uh, two, two feet high. And so that's where we first started the session. And then fortunately, Ultimaker saw our Kickstarter back in 2015, no, it was 2016, and they donated 3D printers for that experience. So we've had a lot of help along the way. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, like, um, if you were to start a company right now, today, would you still go into mm -hmm. 3D printing or you would rather go into, like, some kind of, like, different technology? Yeah, I think the company's mission totally is what drives what you purchase. It's all about uh, what you want to do. And so I would base my decision first off of uh, what it is I'm trying to put out in, into the world and what's going to add value for the uh, population that I'm trying to serve versus um, necessarily which technology I'm going to buy. Because I think if you put your mission first and keep that front and center, the rest will um, work itself out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, based on what you said and based on the mission that you had, do you think uh, the mission uh, did evolve with time? So uh, was it something like you started with the idea of 3D printing and then moved into STEM and then to something else, or it's been like pretty much consistent for the whole period of time? It has been pretty consistent for the whole period of time. We always wanted to expose girls to STEM through 3D printing because, like I said, it combines that creative and that making muscle, um, just the creativity in general. So um, that's been consistent. We do find that a lot of our girls are getting older and we try to show them what the next girls in STEM level experiences are. Um, through different organizations that are in those hometowns. So um, that's definitely important. But as 3D printers become more and more in the home or common, 
um, among certain spaces. We hope to provide the curriculum and the mentorship so that girls can go out and do this on their own. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you always target the same uh, audience? Uh, I, I mean, in terms of the age, like do you target like 10 to 12 to, 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 to how old like girls? Yeah, so we target the seven to 10 year old age range. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we target that because usually around 10 to 11 middle school is when kids start saying no and shutting out different opportunities for themselves, whether it be um, academic or sports related. Um, we, we find at a young age that, I mean, even if I'm sure you can think of an experience you might have had as a child where you tried something once or twice and um, didn't think you weren't good at it, so you pursued on a different path. Um, so that's why we focus on that young of an age range to show girls that it is exciting. It is for them. It's related to them. All of our sessions have theme like fashion or animation to show girls that, um, it STEM is already related to what they're interested in. And, um, that's been our main focus all along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like my personal experience have been pretty, pretty weird, to be honest, because I had <laughs> like uh, a set of uh, like uh, Barbies and then I had uh -huh. uh, siblings. Uh, and once I, I just remember coming back uh, to home and then I, I, I see all of the dolls just like totally broken. And mm -hmm. I think I was crying for the whole day and then I just uh, refused to, to get any more dolls and started to do something else but i think uh you're you're totally right with this uh age and that's what i see based on our like local experience because uh i'm leading our of code activity for kazakhstan and i know that mm -hmm. uh, girls at seven are quite open to do whatever and then they're getting more and more and more close to all the stem related experiences and they somehow associate mm -hmm. this with math and do uh just to move out uh, of the stem overall yeah mm -hmm. uh, so again yeah and one thing about that is um i couldn't agree more it all depends on the image that you're given about a job at a young age. So uh, statistics show that children have a gender identity about a job by the age of six, which is crazy. So we need to be able to combat those identities if we want more innovation. And what what we find is that uh, you can use, you know, what whatever is around you to show um, girls and boys that um, this field is cool. Like I worked, I um, grew up on a farm. And so I thought growing up that being an engineer meant working on tractors or cars. And uh, I didn't find out until college that that is not true and that I could work on fashion and be an engineer. And I think it's just so imperative to show girls at a young age that those things are not mutually exclusive. Mm. And when you see... Uh... I don't remember how you said it exactly. Gender, gender, um, like concept. Gender um, identity. Yeah, gender identity. Do you mean mm -hmm. that, for example, they start to believe that uh, being a farmer, let's say, is a man's job, or do you mean something exactly. else? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So being yeah. a farmer is for a man. Being a teacher is for a woman. Which we find that if there is. Uh, more equality in both of those fields um, the younger children or the people that they serve will uh, benefit as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so does it mean that we should start at something like five years old because five seems to be like really a small really young kid yeah so the ages of zero to five are actually when a child's brain is developing the most so it is very important that uh, we do start very young and it can be as simple as um, the books that you read to children, um, the posters that you expose them to, the media you consume. Um, everything is really impacting kids at such a young age. 
And it, it is important for parents to be mindful of what they're exposing their children to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, but let me get back again to the uh, 2014 when you started the whole thing. Uh, as as mm -hmm. we talked, you, you you had a co-founder, uh, and you still have it. You, you still have her uh, with you, and it's been like six years, and six years is pretty long time period. So I wonder, uh, how do you both? Uh, collaborated during uh, this time. Did you have any like tough periods when you totally disagreed that everyone wanted to pursue uh, something else, or did you just like totally uh, get along? Yeah, that's a great question. So Julia and I are very um, different in the ways that we work and even in our strengths. So. She is um, much more, I would say, um, about big picture and um, casting the vision. And I'm much more detail oriented. Um, and even in our strengths and what we focus on, she's um, much more financials and accounting um, focused. And I'm much more about design. And um, we're both pretty good at marketing. But so we find that our strengths actually really benefit from one another. And I've just learned so much from Julia about how to lead a team, um, how to motivate people, how to hold people accountable, um, how to set really big goals. So um, it's been a very positive experience overall. And I think that I've hopefully um, taught her a few things about being more detail oriented um, and um, ensuring that we're focusing on the girls and the parents first, since that's who we're serving. So uh, we do have strengths that um, balance one another out. And through the time that we've had working together, I would say we yeah, have had our fair share of disagreements. And um, definitely those um, disagreements it sometimes can last longer than others, but it's always been important for us that we are pretty transparent with one another and um, that we put the mission of Maker Girl first. And oftentimes um, that can mean one of us just um, you know, it starts with very simple principles that we learn in kindergarten, such as I'm sorry and um, admitting to our mistakes. And that's how we've been able to work together. And I think we just both really enjoy um, the process of building a company. So that's what has kept us here um, as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you have um, any moments when uh, you were like really close to uh, to stop doing it, to just like move in the different direction? Because uh, what I wonder about is that uh, you have Maker Girl as a part-time project. And I, I think you've mentioned this in the interview that uh, it's really important for you to have the balance. And sometimes you, you just can't find the balance. So I wonder, if, did, did you have this kind of like really tough, tough moments uh, that you overcome? Mm. I know this is hard to um, imagine, but I've, don't think there has been a moment where I've seriously considered ever not working on it. And I think a lot of that is because we've set up structures that it keeps going without us, meaning Julia and I being very involved at a day-to-day -day level. And um, how we've done that is through uh, keeping the university team. So there's the ones running the sessions ongoing. Um, and of course, you know, we are always here for advice and, um, you know, just general help, but there's never been a moment where I've definitely said, I want to stop doing this. And um, I think learning is something that I'm very motivated by. And I feel like I've just learned so much from um, building something, whether it be how to the basics of starting a, a company, like um, getting lawyers involved or fundraising. And it's always felt like a really exciting challenge for me. So um, there have definitely been moments where I've enjoyed the, not enjoyed the work as much. Um, and to get through those times, I think I have taken a step back and 
done less work, but it's never been a matter of quitting altogether. Mm. And um, do you think it might be the case uh, because you're doing this part time? Because what what I feel sometimes is when you're like over over uh, flown uh, with all the information and all the work and mm. the work is your life, then you can struggle sometimes and you're kind of like, hey, I'm over, uh, I'm just like leaving. Uh, but do you think like combining this with your personal things and study and something else helps? Yeah, I actually do think that they pair together very well because it's like, even when I was working at LinkedIn, I felt like um, I had this, um, I was working in a, a larger corporate environment, which I loved my team and I loved working there, but I loved doing like my side hustle um, and having like that entrepreneurial hat on. And I think they both complemented each other really well because I was able to apply what I learned um, in sales at LinkedIn to Maker Girl, and then vice versa, I applied some of the team management and team building exercise from Maker Girl over to LinkedIn, um, and even ran like a team branding work workshop. Um, and then even today, I'm getting my master's in human centered design from the Illinois Institute of Technology on the south side of Chicago, and um, of course that has. Um, enabled me to think more critically about what I'm learning in the context of Maker Girl. Um, so I actually constantly have this experiment um, going to, um, to test my ideas on, to test my knowledge on. Um, so that's a really good point. And I do think that they have worked together really well. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, did you have uh, any plans for the very beginning to make it kind of a, a commercial project or uh, you just wanted to keep it non-profit for forever and ever? We definitely did not have plans at the beginning to uh, ever make it commercial because we um we, like I said, we were working on it part-time and we just wanted to educate girls. Um, now that we have um, shifted more to um, having a full-time executive director and um, we've gotten just really good at overall like operations, it's, um, we wanna figure out ways that um, we can continue to educate and serve more girls. And it could be through commercial means, it could be just through continuing to do nonprofit um, hard to say because we haven't dug into that conversation very much, um, but it's definitely all about keeping the girls front and center and providing them with an experience that really makes them think and really impacts them because it is really just, I mean, if you think back to your childhood, there might be just specific moments that made you look at the world differently or even see yourself differently. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we hope to provide for girls. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess you should be uh, already getting some uh, time-proofed uh, feedbacks because it's been like six years again. And I guess some of the girls who just went for the workshops should be like 16 or maybe like 17 years old right now. So what do you hear? Yeah, so uh, one of our youngest maker girls, Addie, um, her dad is on our board because he's loved it um, right away. He, she is now 12 or 13 years old, which is crazy. And um, so when she was younger, her dad dropped her off for school and was like, bye, baby girl. I love you. And she um, said, Dad, I'm not your baby girl. I'm a maker girl. And this was really powerful because she identified as someone um, that is a maker that can build and dream and um, execute upon her ideas. And when she moved across the country recently, she wanted to set up a debate club. And um, her dad attributes a lot of this mentality to maker girl. Um, because she wanted to see something in her classes and her, um, she wanted to learn something new. So 
she just decided to set it up. And um, this is something that I feel like a lot of high schoolers and college age students think about uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective is I want to build an organization or a product that I want to see in the world. But for um, a young teenager or preteen to do this is really impressive. Yeah. So I, I think this bring, uh, will bring me to the question of uh, how do you measure success? How, what is success for the maker girl company? Yeah. To be honest, this has been a really hard question for us because when you're working with uh, younger kids, anything can impact them. <laughs> um, I mean, like I said, making crafts is what impacted me at a young age. And um, so we've definitely gotten better at this. And right now we're attributing success as um, taking a next step in STEM, whether that means uh, going to another maker role session or um, doing something at home or talking about it at home. So we've um, interviewed a bunch of parents and that's something that we try to do all the time is get an understanding for whether maker girls continue to talk about the session afterwards um, and also understanding what they're doing at home afterwards with their parents. Mm -hmm. And how do you measure this? Uh, do you send out questionnaires to the parents? Uh, how many parents would uh, fill in the questionnaires? Yeah, we have, um, we recently started the parent survey, and actually that was a project uh, that I used much of my design degree um, to do, of course, combined with a help from our board of advisors, and um, we have um, had about a 12% response rate, so anywhere from 10 to 15% is good, and especially for parents at this time when uh, they just have so many things going on and so many competing priorities. I consider that a win. Um, and so then we're also trying to do a better job of um, just measuring overall what what girls are coming back to our sessions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I, I see. Yeah, uh, why I'm asking is because, uh, again, for example, for our of code, we have some really basic metrics, uh, which is like number of participants and um, how mm -hmm. many kids of this age, how many girls, like how it's compared to the total population. Um, mm -hmm. However, uh, what I'm what I'm kind of like keen uh, on is to to be able to measure more, and I think. Uh, in a way, migrating to online right now helps. Okay, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. help uh, the parents because I, I think parents are kind of like, what is going on? And all the school uh, teachers are really broke in a way. Uh, however, I, I think in terms of the measurement, um, it helps. So I just wonder like how maker girls uh, feel uh, feels right now uh, due to the COVID situation? And do you think this is something that is going to stay? Uh, are we moving online? Is online good? So I have the whole bunch of questions regarding online. So you can just start with any. And um, <laughs> yeah, I'm really uh, interested in that. So just future trends with online learning is what you're curious about? Uh, I think it's more uh, how you view, uh, what's your point of the view uh, on the current situation? Uh, do you think it's a mess? Uh, do you think it's for good? Do you think it's for bad? Do you think it's gonna change? Mm. Yeah. I think it's a mess uh, for sure and I, I'm not a teacher or a parent and I really feel for them. Um, I don't know. I don't know how they're getting through their day to day, -to -day lives with this going on um, and managing, you know, before we were always busy. Um, and of course, COVID has slowed down our lives a bit, but now I can't imagine the added burden of uh, feeling responsible for your child's education. Um, I think a lot more of um, education is being placed on parents and that is a really busy job. Um, 
but I, the silver lining with that is um, that hopefully there will be more options for schools. Um, and by that, I mean, hopefully there will be um, more avenues for learning, whether maybe for some children online is the best option. Um, and for some children going in person is best. And um, hopefully there will be more after school programs and um, nonprofits like Maker Girl taking a responsibility, even though, um, you know, we're not going to be the primary means of educating a child. I think that after school programs and academic and sports kind of all are what educate a child together. So hopefully there will be um, more of a reliance on um, the holistic education versus just using school as a means of um, how my child gets from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think for your company specifically, uh, you'll be moving uh, to online more or uh, you're really focused on being like offline? Yeah, hopefully when life returns back to normal, and I put that in quotes because who knows what that's going to look like, uh, we will be both. Um, online has been really powerful for reaching more girls, and that's something that we've always wanted to do is uh, reach girls in rural and underserved areas. I'm particularly um, passionate about reaching girls in rural areas since I grew up in a very small town. Um, but the one of the best parts of a 3D printing session is when you actually get to see live um, your item being 3D printed and the girls look down at their item and just love um, to watch, you know, the, the process of it being built layer by layer. So we definitely want to continue getting back into uh, the university classrooms. And also the experience has been really powerful for um, our volunteers as well, who um, love actually being physical and with the maker girls in the 3D printing labs and um, being able to educate them and help them with their computer in person um, is a much different experience, of course, than online. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if I get this correctly, then uh, still the bigger focus will be on the offline because you think it's uh, way more powerful. Um, I think it's a more powerful experience, but I think it's, um, we've had a lot of repeat attendees with online. So I don't think it's fair at this point to say which one is going to be, um, more powerful or more important for us, um, because we're still trying to figure out, um, what online looks like. I mean, we've done an amazing job pivoting, but um, there might be opportunities for like a level two and level three because we have so many girls coming to our online sessions and for multiple sessions, um, they want more maker girl and like a next step. So that's been something that we've been considering with the online experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I just got the idea that maybe augmented reality is something that is kind of like at the same um um uh, uh, at the same level with uh, 3D printing, which is not really a 3D printing, but kind of like real or trying to be real in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is it called? Uh, augmented uh, reality. Uh, I, I mean- Oh, like, AR, okay. Yeah, AR, uh, Google Glass yeah. thing and like everything in, in this space. Yeah, I mean, it'd be amazing to partner with one of those companies so that uh, girls could see what their customized 3D printed item actually looks like and what mm -hmm. that process is like to see it being 3D printed because I think that's when the girls feel really powerful is that when they see their own item, which they designed being printed instead of just any um, item and being printed by a 3D printer. Yeah, what has been your first item? Uh, a keychain for a backpack. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's something useful. That's something that reminds you that yes. uh, you did it. 
Okay. Yes, of course. Uh, so um, I'm sure that part of our future audience uh, will be people, and uh, maybe specifically women, who are kind of like really keen to start their own uh, nonprofits. And the thing here is always how to keep this sustainable, how to have a sustainable nonprofit, because you, you depend on everyone, like on anyone doing the donations and you need to, to do crowdfunding sometimes. So do you have um, any advices here on how to build a sustainable nonprofit? Yeah, uh, and with nonprofit, it is, it is particularly difficult um, because most of the money is built upon fundraising. But um, that would be my first challenge, actually, is to consider ways that um, you can make your nonprofit rely not just on um, fundraising dollars, whether you're actually like selling a service, um, whether you have like a one for one model like Tom's, where um, let's say um, we provide this for this person and you're benefiting another person. So um, you kind of have this, um, this like personalization to it almost. And one thing that we didn't always do the best job at, which we're getting better at, is maintaining relationships with our donor base and really strong relationships and um, just making sure that we know who they are and what they care about so that hopefully they want to support the nonprofit again. Um, but even if they don't, um, being able to understand what that donor profile even looks like. So those are the two pieces of advice I would recommend is um, having a sustainable model and staying in touch with your donors and continuing to give them updates um, so that when you ask for money again, it's just a very easy conversation. Um, and I would actually also recommend reading a book um, by Scott Harrison, who founded Charity Water. It's called Thirst um, and looking at a lot of their content because they've done an amazing job at this and um, making it a very personalized experience for their donors. Mm. Okay. And when you are saying donors, uh, do I understand correctly that you mean both uh, just people and the companies? Yes, individuals and companies. Okay. And mm -hmm. do, do, do you think uh, individuals are easier to go for versus companies or companies are easier and kind of like more predictable or it just totally depends on the situation? Oh, uh, define easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you mean by easy? Uh, I, I mean, like, um, easier to agree, easier to get involved, to get interested, uh, to like eventually donate money. Hmm. Individuals, I would say, are always easier because you can relate to them at a very personal level. And, um, of course, we've had a lot of friends and family supporting our mission because um, more than they love our mission, they just love us and want to see us succeed. Um, Julia and I and even the rest of our team has gotten a lot of their family members involved and friends. So definitely individuals, but I would say individuals are also less predictable. So you never know what's going to happen in their lives. Whereas with a company, if you kind of lay out this model for them, it's like, um, okay, we're going to ask you in July again, or, um, and then we're going to have an update call in April. It's pretty easy to keep that recurring commitment. Um, so definitely individuals at a, a personal level, but um, individuals are so unpredictable in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I think you have this uh, really interesting point about uh, having a uh, regular uh, update for everyone involved. 
And I wonder mm -hmm. how regular is regular. So do you do it monthly, bi-monthly, like yearly, quarterly? Yeah, we do quarterly uh, with both companies and we try to do that uh, with some of our biggest individual supporters. So um, that could look like a phone conversation. It could just look like, like right now, um, Julia had this amazing idea to send a coloring page in the mail that has um, maker girls on it. And you can say, uh, write on it why you're a maker girl um, or how you're embodying the maker girl mentality. So it's important mm -hmm. to get creative with the means as to how you're doing that. Um, but definitely just make sure that you have a plan and that you're following the plan because um, like in, in the nonprofit world, especially now, things are coming up all the time and new challenges are constantly um, arising. But in order to, to have that sustainability, um, it's important to stick with the things that uh, maybe won't bring you fruit right away, but will be um, ensuring that you have that in the long term. Mm. And uh, do I understand correctly that uh, at the very beginning, when you started, uh, both of you work on this part time and then you had a team of volunteers uh, who supported the whole thing. And then you yes. moved to, to, to having a first full time employee <laughs> who is a uh, yeah. director at the same time. So what happened? Uh, why did you go for that? And what was the milestone or... Um, uh, what was the event that led to that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So to answer your previous question, uh, we did, Julia worked at Deloitte. Um, she worked there at a college and she's still there. And I worked at LinkedIn. So um, we were managing Maker Girl part-time, um, but we had very strong leaders at the university who um, we're very capable of just continuing the day-to-day -day operations. And so we set up a structure and we set up um, basically check-in milestones to ensure that they were um, doing well. But when we hired a full-time executive director, um, we found that we wanted to expand to another campus. So previously we were at the University of Illinois and um, we had a really exciting opportunity to expand to Northwestern University um, up here in Evanston near Chicago. And uh, we knew that with this expansion, we did not have the bandwidth to do all of this well um, part-time, which is why we did hire a full-time executive director. And her name was Stephanie Hine. Um, she's still involved with Maker Girl. Um, but has moved on to another job, which she loves. And so what we found with that is um, we really wanted to keep Maker Girl going and at a sustainable level. Um, and we wanted to keep our donors updated too. And we found that that was really hard to do with us both working part-time. So it was the expansion to Northwestern that really is what pushed us to hire someone full-time. And since then it, it's, made our jobs and lives more exciting to have someone full-time running the show and um, be managing that person. And it, it's enabled us to dream really big too, because um, we never would have been able to pull off this transition to having virtual sessions and um, getting a lot of our friends and family involved, uh, like through our big Chicago cocktail fundraiser in the fall. So um it's been a lot of fun for us and it, it's definitely been a new direction and um, putting that stake in the ground of hiring someone full-time has um, enabled us to treat it more like a, a big nationwide nonprofit, which it is rather than a, a startup out of college. Mm -hmm. And when you're saying this, uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, about all the companies which uh, grew within, like, let's say, two months or three months. And then you see uh, companies like hiring and hiring and hiring people uh, or trying to hire someone first uh, in order to be able uh, to fundraise later on uh, to continue uh, operating. And... Um, 
I'm just curious uh, what kind of approach you use because you seem to be pretty much focused on a number of locations and then you added extra person but you're still not doing like the whole country or like everywhere. Uh, so why, why not to go like for, for the for every US college or every US university just to send like emails to everyone and saying like, hey, we're, we're, we're into something. Uh, why, why are you not doing this? Uh, expanding is hard mm -hmm. <laughs> and it requires university volunteers that are really committed. Okay. And we wanna make sure that we have that model uh, down where we can um, be able to understand what the level of involvement is for the university volunteers as well. And I definitely think we're very close to that place of being able to just basically say, like treat it as a franchise. It's like, here's what you need to know. Here's what you do. Contact us at XYZ locations. But mm -hmm. it is a lot of work for our executive director to be able to hold all of those university volunteers accountable. Um, and we'd rather do just a better job at um, serving, let's say, six universities really well versus 20 and not necessarily know where they're at. So we're close. <laughs> no, no, no. It, but it, 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 so it's generally uh, a quality over quantity. That's the approach as I hear it. Yeah, when it comes to uh, setting up a new academy, which is a university location, we want to ensure that there's quality. And we found that the biggest, um, the most important piece of the puzzle is having committed volunteers who are excited um, and accountable to doing what they're, what they said they are going to do. Um, but in terms of the girls, quantity is important. We want a lot of people to be exposed to Maker Girl and have that really rich experience um of of the three printing session mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um yeah got it so if we're talking about the universities and how do you, uh, how, how you choose uh the university what should be the prerequisites uh in order for you to get there um the prerequisite for volunteers uh, for the university, Let, let's say there is a university uh, or so, someone from the university coming to you and uh, asking for oh. having Maker Girl uh, there. Uh, what would you ask? Yeah, so surprisingly, a lot of universities have uh, one or two 3D printers, mm. and maybe they're like more for an engineering campus uh, where they're like the bigger industrial kind but they don't have the lab of like five, like of the two to three foot 3D printers. So that's been a challenge for us. Um, and then the other prerequ prerequisite is a team of um, folks in college, usually college STEM women who wanna see our mission carried out um, that are really excited about Maker Girl and have a track record of um, being able to work in an organization and run that well, whether it be through a sorority or a business fraternity. Um, so that's another prerequisite. We also have found that it works better when those two to three academy founders are friends, because like Julia and I, they're going to want to enjoy working together. They're going to build one another up um, rather than trying to create a relationship and build something together at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think that's been a really, really interesting point on like having friends and having some someone just to cheer you up. And that's why I think like mm -hmm. sole, be, being sole founder uh, sucks sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Did you start your coding organization with someone? Uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's been... A tricky story, to be honest, because uh, I, I just came back from Russia to Kazakhstan and uh, a friend of mine asked me to join uh, 
uh, to join the company that he was going to build alongside with two mm -hmm. other people. So we're, uh, we've been four people in the group and we started a network of coding school for kids. And then I, I just wanted to have not, not a single school in a single area, but to have something larger than that. And that's, um, how I came to this hour of code idea. I just learned that there is an initiative and then we started to do this. Uh, but uh, I got into troubles within the first year because I, I've been trying to do everything by myself and I remember myself just sitting at the desk uh, really deep at night drinking Red Bull all the time and trying to, mm. to pretend for <laughs> external parties that I have the whole team. And I have like a videographer, mm. photographer, uh, whomever we need. So like a coder, uh, everyone else. And then I, I just like really got burnt out uh, after mm. uh, we've done the event. And then I started to hire people for that, like kind of like project-based work uh, for three months uh, out of the year. And they're doing the work. Uh, at first, we didn't pay. Later, when we got funding, we started to uh, to pay to everyone. And I think it's kind of like fair because people are really involved, and I I wanted them to be compensated well for for their efforts. We're not mm -hmm. paying to volunteers who are who are uh, organizing the events uh, within multiple regions, but we're paying for the main team sitting here and doing all the pre-work and hard work and post-work. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is how it yeah. works. Yeah, I think that is interesting. So I have um, tried to work on things kind of by myself too, and it's definitely very isolating. And I think it's, not necessarily the work, but it's the mental bandwidth of like, what do I do next? Or I'm just not like enjoying this as much. So it's, that's where a co-founder can be really fun um, to just bounce ideas off of. You're kind of sharing that like stress in a way of starting something. And, um, but if there is a definitely a place for single founders and for that, I found that it's best to have an accountability buddy that also is someone that you want to emulate in some way, or even just someone to have fun with and chat with and cheer one another on um, rather than working in complete isolation for, so for anyone that is starting something alone, um, I recommend just having a 15 minute chat with like a cheerleader every week that is about what you're going to do that week or, um, what ways that you're struggling so that you can just share ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. And um, yeah, let's talk about the partner partnerships a bit here. Um, because as far as I know, there are plenty of uh, organizations uh, within the US and outside of US who are into uh, computer science and STEM areas. Um, so I'm really interested, uh, if you work closely with any of them, uh, and how, how do you, like, if you do, how do you partner or how do you work with them? We do not work super close with any of them, but it's funny, pre COVID and very close to COVID, we were, uh, going to partner with another organization in Chicago um, and they have locations now in Pennsylvania and, and such too called Tech Girls um, because we wanted to have that like next step after a maker girl session. Um, so we found that a lot of families have like older and younger girls and we wanted the older girl to be able to go to Tech Girls and the younger girl to be able to go to Maker Girl or even if you are a maker girl just to be exposed to Tech Girls is like this is what you could do next. So um, that is something that we thought about pre-COVID, um, but it's not something that we've necessarily focused as much on. Um, partnerships do require a lot of effort and energy, and um, we wanted to just make sure that we're doing the best job we can to serve maker girls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I hear that. So, um, and 
-hmm. We do also spotlight organizations in our newsletter um, to be able to show parents like what else they could be doing with their child in a STEM related context at home or in the classroom. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's quite a popular question from the parents when they have a uh, really <laughs> good experience with something. They're they're asking for more, so they're all interested. And mm -hmm. what else? What else is there? What else can I do? Totally agree. Totally. Yeah. So um, as we're talking about. Uh, how we build the future that we want to have right now. Uh, how do you think Maker Girl contributes to, to the future? Like, what will be different because of the thing you're doing right here and right now? Yeah, so um, what we found and um, I mean, even in my own classes, um, I love the, the diversity and I think um, more diverse spaces uh, create safety, but they also create um, products and experiences that are equitable for everyone involved. And that's what Maker Girl is leading up to. So if we have more girls in STEM, um, there will be, hopefully be more products in the world that are made um, with men, women, um, different races in mind. And of course, this is me coming at this question from a very designer lens of like, if only a certain demographic of people are making products and experiences, um, those will not be fitting for everyone. <laughs> um, so hopefully that will be a direct outcome, but we just want to see more, um, more maker girls in the world. And that means women stepping up um, and being the change that they wish to see. We define a maker girl as someone that lives in dreams as an unstoppable force that says yes to the challenges of the future. And we want more women emulating that, um, which will in turn lead to future generations of women emulating that. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think it helps uh, for the younger girls? To, like, let, let's say uh, if we have a girl of, who is seven years old and then we have another one who's like 10 years old. Do you think having somebody at uh, 10 years old, who's 10 years old, um, is, is it really helping to the younger one to, uh, to, to get into STEM? Or uh, it's more about parents to the kids relations or uh, teachers to the kids relations. So uh, how do young kids uh, learn? Do they learn from peers or from seniors? Uh, can you repeat that last part again? Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. From... Uh, do, do younger kids learn more from peers or from uh, parents, uh, teachers? Like who, who do you think is more influential? Mm. So from a representation standpoint, I think the home is where everything starts. Um, I think parents are the biggest educators that there are in a child's life um, because they're the ones responsible for the child's development from like zero ages zero to five. Um, and from the um, peer standpoint versus the parent, I definitely think it's important to have um, someone who's a few steps ahead of you in that field, which is why parents and girls themselves love the fact that college STEM women are the volunteers of our Maker Girl session because it's much easier for the girl to be able to put herself in that college student's shoes versus like, um, someone who is much older than them, like an adult. So um, we found that the college women are very powerful. So I would argue for the big sister, but with that said, um, I didn't have sisters growing up. So I think if my brothers would have been cheering me on, which they do, um, that would have been very powerful. And um, even if you just have anyone, any female in your life that's um, cheering you on, telling you that you can be whatever you want to be, that's what's going to be most important. 
Yeah, I think I have a perfect chance of being that cheering female to someone else's life. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, being, I think we all do. Being uh, being a Forbes uh, under thirty, uh, how do you feel about that? How did you learn about this? <laughs> Um, did you uh, apply on person? Did someone nominate you? How, how it was? Yeah, it was super exciting. Um, we were nominated by uh, my, our professor, actually, Noah Isserman, and he was the professor of the social entrepreneurship class mm -hmm. um, where Makerville got started. So it's been um, just so sweet and awesome to have him on this journey with us he went from um professor to advisor to friend um so that's been amazing and um i believe we've applied before so for anyone that um is qualified for the award um and wants it i would say keep applying and keep asking people different people to nominate you um and overall, it just, it's, uh, it was a really powerful experience to go to New York. I went to the um, launch party, actually, and um, meet the other recipients and hear their stories. It was um, really cool. And I, I definitely want to stay in touch with them. And um, I would say, though, it's important to just um, keep pushing on and keep your identity um more so rooted in um, the things that matter to you versus awards and acknowledgements, because I think those things are really powerful and um, confirm that you're um, doing well and on the right track, but they don't um, necessarily keep you or they don't keep me motivated day to day. <laughs> Did it help anyhow so far? What? Did it help anyhow so far? Did it what? I, I, I mean, like um, uh, being a Forbes under 30, um, did it help you anyhow? Oh, okay. Um, I do think it really helps to have conversations with people. Um, when you put that on your resume or your LinkedIn profile, there definitely is an esteem um, to be able to have conversations with uh, folks that um, maybe are much more older or more accomplished than you. Um, so I'd say that's the thing that it's helped the most with. And like I said, it's um, just been exciting to have the network and acknowledgement and confirmation that we're doing a, a really powerful, uh, big work Got it, got it. I think it's it's been pretty much the same for me as well. So I totally mm -hmm. agree. Um, I've heard a couple of uh, answers uh, that are, uh, my mom was super happy. So it's been, no. <laughs> yeah, they've been. A how do you, how would you say it's helped you now that you're a couple, you're one year out of it? Yeah, um, I, I think if we um, if we just jump like to to the parents, um, I just brought the magazine to them and they they uh, like my parents told me like, hey, you're in the magazine, cool, that's it. But they're not <laughs> I'm, like uh, much much into it. So I think it's more on my side that I'm trying. Um, uh, yeah, I totally agree that, yeah. uh, that, that this is not something that you kind of like put somewhere and then you're telling to everyone, hey, I'm this and I'm that. It's more about doing the job, but uh, it helps. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Um, the reactions that you get are totally different. And I mean, some people, um, it all depends on how you esteem the award, but um, like some people called me and were like, so happy and then some of the people that you expect that are most close to you are like hey congrats <laughs> and like very casual like but I guess those are people that have high expectations for you anyway so <laughs> sure. Sure. yeah and uh I, I think by um by having this word for 
at the very end of the discussion and I would just like stop here. Uh, I'm really thankful uh, for having you in the discussion for uh, for your time. And I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to share my story, Aliona. And I hope that um, this is valuable for anyone that's uh, wanting to start a nonprofit or wanting to start something with a, a social mission. Feel free to contact me. Yeah, sure. Um, Definitely will do this. And uh, I, I think in my network, uh, I have like really uh, a huge number of women in STEM. Uh, plus, okay. if you might be uh, interesting at the certain point of like being in contact with uh, somebody, let's say from the Hour of Code team, for example, both in States or in Europe, um, happy to connect. Okay, awesome. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah.